in case you haven't worked this out yet, I am a reading feminist. And I basically come to martial arts to ruin your cosy white heterosexual cisgender boys club with my killjoy internet intersectional fe feminism and tendency to actually learning and practicing kung fu so because uh, i am a feminist i like to listen to sweary feminist podcasts and um where they mostly rage about donald trump and you know, Harvey Weinstein and they shout and swear about it, stuff like that. Um, now these are normally pop culture feminists. Um, I'm not really a pop culture person, but I find that uh, pop culture feminists are more kind of inclusive and a lot less judgmental. And they also kind of cover a right wider range of subjects, to be honest with you. Um, now, my DVD collection is basic, uh, I don't really have, you know, I don't really watch films, but I do have a remarkably large number of uh, martial arts films in my DVD collection. Uh, it does also feature the works of Joss Whedon rather heavily, um, and I have a few Mighty Boosh DVDs, but that's pretty much the extent of my DVD collection, because I'm not really very good at films. So, but there is clearly a gap in the market because uh, the pop culture feminists, they don't really talk about uh, martial arts that much. So obviously what you've all been waiting for, you've all been champing at the bit, desperately hoping that I will do, is feminist reviews of martial arts films. So here we go. I'm going to start with Lady Snowblood, Love Song of Vengeance. God, that's a great title, isn't it? And it kind of stands out, you know, you've usually got your Iron Fist, Drunken Fist, Legend of Fisting, or whatever. You know, they, the titles can sort of all blur into one a little bit. But um, this one very much stands out. And I bought it mainly, well, obviously to start with, because there's a woman doing all the fighting, but also because it involves anarchism and... Um, I am an anarchist as well, so I will be pushing my anarchist views on you. So, uh, there you go. Anarcho-feminism, brilliant. Just what you need in martial arts, I would say. Now, um, to start with, this is really not a laugh, okay? You don't get no funny wicks or ridiculously overdone fight scenes, no comedy gore. This is actually quite a serious film. I mean, it is actually you know, not, and I don't just mean it's seriously made. Like, it's really miserable and it just gets worse and worse as time goes on. So, um, you don't, don't watch this for fun, basically, but it is a very good film. Okay, so we open up here. This is the opening scene in a graveyard. Great, huh? Cheery start. And um, Yuki Kashima, Lady Snowblood, is a mourning some dead people. Don't really know who. I think it's something to do with the first film. This is the second Lady Snowblood film. And, um, yeah, it sort of starts off in this kind of, it's daylight, but it still looks dark. And it's nice foliage, nice surroundings, but it looks dark. It pretty much looks dark throughout the film, even in daylight. It's just like, it, that's just the atmosphere all the time. It's generally quiet, generally dark. So, she's here, morning at the fruit, and oh look, a load of guys coming at her with swords. And what I love about this is she's just casually walking away, really, and then just slashes occasionally at someone who has a go at her. Um, or two people, if two people are stupid enough to have a go. Now, the reason that she's walking so almost casually is that she's actually wearing these sort of flip-flop clogs, uh, which just you know it means that she's not doing any of these kind of leaping and twirling things uh, she basically had to i guess adapt her fighting style to the fact that she's wearing these basically hobbling footwear um and she wears it throughout the film and that's pretty much how she always does things i mean she leaps over stuff occasionally but with her hands you know she doesn't jump exactly 
So, um, you might remember in the first Kill Bill film, and oh, look at that, she's just pretty much casually dispatched about eight men there. So, pretty awesome, don't you think? And um, she kind of carries on like that through the film. So anyway, um, in Kill Bill, the first film, Oren Ishii, uh, when she's finally facing Beatrix Kiddo, she's actually wearing these sort of flip-flop clogs. But um, she slips her feet out of them to fight in the snow wearing her socks. And I can't blame her because, my God, that must be so awkward. You certainly couldn't run in them the way that she did. But, um, yeah. So that's, uh, but she never ever takes them off. She's always wearing those things. And um, I just think that's pretty amazing. So, um, she eventually gets caught. She's injured, she's trapped by the sea. And she's uh, surrounded by about 50 men, I think it was. Something like that. So she kind of gives up and goes, allows herself to be, arrested and she gets rescued on her way to the gallows by uh, these guys in masks and uh, some crazy guy who uh, you see him again later he's just like really violent nasty piece of work and um, she gets taken to the head of secret police yeah that's the crazy guy oh he's a he's a bit crazy really violent <laughs> so she gets taken to this guy Kikui he was really quite menacing uh, this is about the only time there is any kind of music and it's just this whine <laughs> low whine of a stringed instrument or something and the occasional knocking of a sort of stave and um, yeah, this guy is really evil. It's the head of secret police for Japan. Oh, and there's the tiger. Um, that tiger seems to be used a lot in to accentuate his nastiness. I'll talk about that later. Um, but you see, it kind of um, is this whole thing. It's just dark again. It's generally really understated. And I think that on the whole, that and kind of really held down and kind of grim. And I think that kind of accentuates the brutality when it actually happens. So he tells her to go and spy on an anarchist called Tokunaga and find a letter and bring it to him. Yeah, so he's kind of like, you owe me because I've rescued you. God, don't you hate it when people fall steps on you. So, um... The thing is, this guy, to, look at him, quite like, there's all these close-ups on him, he does just look grim horribly all the time. So, um, this anarchist guy, he actually is really quite smart, and um, he works out who she is pretty quickly, and why she's there. And this is him telling her the story of the letter and what happened. It's basically some young man who was really miserable and having a terrible time bombed a police station. Kikui, the evil police, secret police chief, managed to blame his group of anarchists and put a load of them to death, but they couldn't get him and he was the one they really wanted. So, but the guy who planted the bomb, he wrote a letter to his mother telling him, t telling her what had really happened. And now he's got a letter. So obviously they don't want this letter to surface because it was revealed that it was a whole frame up job. Now, um, I want to talk a bit about. Um, Representation of anarchists. Now, normally anarchists, I get quite irritated and quite annoyed with the way that anarchists are represented in media, in films, and in, you know, on TV and stuff like that. 
But um, this is actually kind of, the, this is actually very much how anarchists see the way things happen to them, you know, like, it's very unlikely that an anarchist would actually plant a bomb, really. It's far more likely that they would get framed for it. And just as an example, um, since about 2010, there has been a number of revelations in the UK about undercover police officers infiltrating not just anarchist groups, but also groups like um, the family of Stephen Lawrence, a black man who was murdered in a racially motivated attack. Now, um, anyway, one of these <laughs> police, it turns out, was a man who had firebombed a shop in the 1980s and he was actually an undercover police officer. It was supposed to be an animal rights protest, but it wasn't really them. It was this guy working with them, but it was him. So, um, the idea is here, the plan that he has, is to go to a large meeting of um, the general public, underclass people who have got big grievance, and read out the letter so that they can probably have a riot. You know, preferably they want really, you know, to overthrow the status quo and stuff like that. He wants a revolution, so that's the idea. Now, before um, they go to this meeting, he uh, gives. Yuki the letter so and tells her that if they're apprehended she has to run away with the letter which is what happens and she manages to get away by uh, falling in a river after being shot and he is arrested and um, taken away and brutally tortured and it's really horrible now um, okay so there is uh, this anarchist guy, he has a wife and um, I think, I need to go back to the next one, he has a wife and um, she goes to, now Yuki was told to take it to take the letter to his brother, Tokunaga, who is a doctor, and um, give it to him. Now, um, Aya, goes, his wife, goes to this doctor and begs him to help her to get her brother, her husband back. Um, now, but she does a thing here that I really don't think any anarchist wife would do. And, and to be honest, she's a bit rubbish. I mean, she mostly just looks pretty. And, um, oh yeah, see? Now, here she's suggesting giving up Yuki to the police to save her husband, the anarchist. Now, the thing is that um, no anarchist wife or girlfriend would be naive enough to think that giving up Yuki would do any good at all. You know, the average anarchist wife or girlfriend would know very well that what would actually happen is that Yuki would just get brutally tortured and killed as well. So um, that seems a bit rubbish to me. And another thing is that um, you wouldn't ever have anarchists like handing people over to the police anyway or reporting people to the police. Um, it's just, I mean, you know, police are a blunt instrument, they're really bad with nuance, so it's not really, uh, and we're all sinners, I mean, it can rebound, we've all done something the police would be interested in, even if it's just, you know, going a few miles an hour over the speed limit, so if you just want to report someone to the police because of some issue you've got with them, you want to settle a mat grudge or something. Now I'm going to stop it there. Um, you know, it's just, there's just no point. I mean, I had uh, trouble with a bunch of anarchist friends a while back. Um, it's kind of why I got into martial arts, not because I was afraid of them, just because I needed something else in my life. 
they caused me trouble for years okay but they never ever they did all sorts of, they were a bit threatening as well they never ever even considered reporting me to the police for anything because um it's just not what you do and um, i mean there was this woman I know, well a couple of years back i did get a visit from the police where uh, apparently someone had called them and said they were worried that i was teaching karate on youtube and um and i'm pretty sure i know who that was this woman who had sort of befriended me and yeah i mean it was just a tactic that she tended to use i mean she did report people to the police quite a lot and it was a tactic that she used to make people feel unsettled or just if she was annoyed with them or anything like that. But anarchists would never bother even doing that because the thing is, anarchists know how to deal with the police on the whole. You know, they know, and it's not that they can just talk their way out of everything. The thing is, they know their rights, they know the law, and they're not going to be intimidated into doing something stupid. So no anarchists would even bother because there's just no point. It's not going to get you anywhere. So, um sorry went off on a tangent there but anyway the point is this anarchist girlfriend right she's rubbish the anarchist wife and it's not just that she does this you know she makes this suggestion really naive and nasty enough to make this suggestion to hand yuki over to the police she um she just kind of looks pretty and hangs around she doesn't really do much most anarchist girlfriends or wives would be a lot more active in stuff uh, a lot more you know make a few more decisions that kind of thing but um she doesn't and what's actually happened here i don't know if you missed it but there was a problem between the anarchist brother and the doctor brother and the problem was that originally aya was with the doctor brother and then when he was off fighting a war on behalf of the japanese overlords he um she left him for the anarchist brother so all she's really doing is like setting up trouble between two brothers and that's kind of her function in this story which to me is yeah from a feminist perspective is just so wrong really um and the other thing is it does fail this does fail the bechdel test for gender representation okay um, which is that there need to be two named female characters in a film and they need to have a conversation about something other than a man. There's only one brief conversation. Okay, we've got two named characters here, Yuki and Aya, but they have one conversation and it's about the anarchist Tokunaga. So that is just, it's not working, basically. So, uh, that's my little rant about the anarchist wife being rubbish. Okay. Now, this bit is brilliant. So, Yuki presumably can hear this conversation. So, when I first watched this, I was thinking, oh God, she's reaching out. What's she going to do? Is she going to, like, stab herself in despair or something? And, oh no, she's looking at that. Oh, oh my God, she's throwing it in the ceiling. What's she done that for? And some blood drips down. Oh my God. <gasps> She stabbed this guy through the ceiling! How cool is that? Okay, now, um, that's the crazy guy. Oh, he's awful. He deserved that. And a lot more. Anyway, um, the reason, <laughs> one of the reasons I wanted to show you that bit was because, um, oh, God. Was because she, um, there's this bit in, the and and kill bill again with oren ishii where um she senses that you know beatrix kiddo's just turned up to the house of blue leaves she senses uh, beatrix kiddo's presence and while you know through the bamboo screen you know, while she and the yakuza's are all laughing and uh, joking and generally causing trouble and she just throws this spike through the bamboo screen it lands this far away from beatrix now um this so so this is very much reminiscent i think of Oren, you know this film what erin ishii did there and um now the thing is that quentin i've looked at the notes at the back of this and quentin tarantino is mentioned and it says that he did um like he considered the director to 
Fujita Tokushia, sorry, I'll get that back right there later. Um, he did consider him like a mentor and an inspiration, and I'm pretty sure this was a brilliant film that he would have watched. And just to say, I will review the um, Kill Bill films in the light of what Emma Thurman has had to say about both Quentin Tarantino and Harvey Weinstein. But that's going to be a little, that's a few films down the line. Um, so, yeah, I think that'll do for this particular section. I'm going to have to do this in two, by the way, because uh, second section does spoilers. And if you don't want spoilers, then don't watch the next section. Okay. But I do want to do the whole film.